This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. Howdy, folks. This is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to my very good friend, Christina Gomez, on Shifting the Paradigm. This is Ray Sobs from the NX Network, and you're listening to Shifting the Paradigm with the intrepid Christina Gomez on the X. You're listening to the NX Network, KUNX DV, Kansas City, Missouri. Welcome to Shifting the Paradigm. I'm Christina Gomez on the Paradigm Shifts channel and on the X, the new mainstream KUNX digital broadcasting talk radio. Are you ready for this? Because we are about to embark on an hour and a half of UFO shenanigans and paranormal adventures. Right here is where we look and think outside the proverbial box. We jump down those rabbit holes where you get a red Tic Tac instead of a red pill. First off, make sure you subscribe and share these shows on social media to those who you think are having their minds and eyes open to the reality of the UFO mystery. All of these shows are great primers. And in the push for more clarity, transparency, and disclosure, the more voices demanding answers, the better. For those listening on KUNX Talk Radio and Affiliates, I have two other shows each week that only air on my YouTube channel. Mysteries with a History is on Thursdays at 2.30 p.m. PST with my co-host Jimmy Church of Faded Black Radio on K1X. And each week we cover a different topic in depth. And on Fridays at 3 p.m. PST, the show Strange Paradigms is where I and a different guest co-host cover all the strange weekly news and mysterious headlines from around the world. However, this Friday show will be pre-recorded as I cannot do a live stream that day and with no co-host, but it's still going to be a lot of fun, so make sure to check it out either on YouTube or on my website, strangeparadigms.com. There you can find all the show archives, more information, and direct video links to my channel. What is one location that just really interests you? One that you just can't get enough of. As many of you know, Skinwalker Ranch and the Uinta Basin has really grabbed my attention these last few years. And I'm excited to say that Skinwalker Ranch has at last opened up the ranch to the public so they can have access to the latest research happenings, blogs, and live feeds of cameras around the ranch. Personally, I've dedicated an entire tablet that plays the feed. I just find it so exciting. And people get to speak with Eric Bard in the live chat for those that are a part of the membership program. And yesterday, Travis Taylor was in the chat as well. So I think that it's such a treat for those that are interested in the location. And seriously, it's only $10 a month with So much information being censored or just not available to the public these days. I think what the ranch is doing is an amazing opportunity. The website is called skinwalker-ranch.com. 
gmail.com. And since I've signed up, a lot of us in the live chat watching the feed have seen some strange anomalies, including videos that were played back by Eric Bard involving lightning happening above the infamous and notorious triangle. I'm not going to say any more because stuff like this is happening all the time. So I thoroughly believe that signing up is worth it. And if you do sign up to be an insider, tell them that Christina sent you. In quick other news, a man who was out fishing in Thailand almost died after a fish jumped out of the water and straight into his mouth and it got wedged inside of the navel cavity. He was rushed to the hospital and survived. The doctor said that there was such a slim chance of him making it after the surgery, but almost like a miracle, he came out of the operation room alive. Doctors also said in all the years as a health professional, they had never seen or heard of a case like this. That's pretty crazy. And the amount of panic that person must have felt was probably insane. Do you have a near-death experience? Write it down in the comments below. Now, let me talk about my guest. Chase Kaletsky is an active leader in UFO and ancient artifacts investigations. She employs a diverse set of skills and professional techniques known as the gold standard. Her work includes admissible inquiry, proper case management, and scientific conclusions. As a former Department of Defense employee and schooled and certified as a former private investigator, Chase constantly demonstrates the knowledge, technical requirements, legal parameters, and commitment to evidence based investigations using the latest technologies and methods as professional law enforcement officials in a modern and forward-looking scientific environment. And as her famous quote goes, because science doesn't care what we believe. Welcome to Shifting the Paradigm, Chase. How's it going? It's really great. I'm so happy to be with you today. This is going to be fun. I'm pretty excited, but you know, let's start with the basics before we get into the meat and potatoes. For my younger audience that may be new to you and your work, can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? I'm a UFO investigator and a researcher, and I've been doing this since 1994. I know it makes me old and grumpy, but I've done so many fields. I believe that you have to be boots on the ground, that you can't investigate from a phone. Police don't investigate from a phone. Um, There's times you just got to get out there and do do that. So I have a lot of field time under my belt um, and I go out there. When we get these reports, um, I go out, we interview the witnesses and, you know, just start our investigation. I've been doing it quite a long time. And you are also an active researcher in the UFO field and ancient artifact investigations. What kind of UFO cases or locations have you investigated so far? (laughs) Hundreds, honestly, hundreds. And um, I think a lot of them you could find on MUFON. And I'd even go further and say probably almost a thousand. I mean, I really have, I really stay busy. Um, and I just don't do uh, UFOs. Like I've been on a ghost hunting team. I've been looking for Bigfoot, um, just I'm in Peru. I'm a forensic specialist. So I have a, you know, a, a forensic kit that would make the sheriff's department jealous, right? So that's why I get into all these other things because I pick up evidence. This is what I do, trace evidence, physical evidence. And that kind of puts me, in a field of my own. I don't know another single investigator out here that's certified in forensics that has the equipment and goes out to the out to the actual sites. You stated that you've almost done a thousand cases. About how many cases do you do a year since 94? It depends on the year, honestly. And I, I don't believe I'm exaggerating. I, you know, there's a lot that I did in MUFON. There's a lot I did with, you know, just independently. Um, I was star team manager. I developed that whole program uh, for MUFON. I, it was my protocols, rules, you know, everything. And you just get busy. You're assigned, even in MUFON, a lot of times. Um, 
when you're the experienced one, you're getting 17, 18, 19 cases a, a day or at a time. And then as you clear them down, you know, you get more. So I was also uh, international MUFON and I think I had what, 16 countries <laughs> that I that I worked as well. So they were all uh, boots on the ground, but um, I was responsible to contact the witnesses, get witness statements and do the best I can from the US. And being a part of MUFON and being a forensic investigator or researcher, you have your own professional technique called the gold standard. Can you walk us through the procedure? Well, the gold standard is really uh, kind of a catchphrase for you don't take shortcuts and you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, the gold standard would be I investigate just like a police department would a murder or robbery or insurance investigator. There's rules that you follow if you're going to have um, admissible and worthy results. And this is all for the witness. I mean, you know, if you're going to do this, you know, let's do it right. And there's a lot of rules out there that, you know, a lot of investigators don't pay attention to or, or don't know. And, you know, so the gold standard, like one of the things, an example would be, uh, latex gloves. You see people, investigators put them on all the time. No. <laughs> latex gloves protects you. Sterile gloves protect your evidence. And that's why a lot of it gets contaminated. So there's little things like that that I use and understand and really stick to that gold standard. So when you've been looking at ancient artifacts with this gold standard, what are you usually looking for in these investigations and what have you looked into so far? Oh, yeah, a lot. It's like the ancient um, pottery and, and the sites that we've been on. So I've been to Peru a lot and I do the forensics. Um, you know, I have the equipment, <laughs> but I have taken so many samples. I think I have a little over 300 of the elongated skulls and these are all DNA samples. And um, of course, pottery, you know, there's a lot you could collect with that as well. A lot of information, even if it's Inca or before. <laughs> so there's a lot of that I have done. Then we get it to the state. Some we can't, some we can't. We have to go through the um, ministry, uh, the museum ministry, and they're tough. Oh my gosh, they're so tough. And there was one investigation that we got to go down to the museo and go into their back room and pick the ones we wanted. And that was really a fun time because, you know, all the people who work at the museum were bringing their moms and their friends in because we're all like, and they're all like taking pictures, CSI, CSI, you know, cause I'm like top to bottom, we're sterile. So, you know, the whole place is, you know, wiped down and covered up and paper on the floor and <laughs> sterile. So that, that was a treat for them. And I didn't realize that these people who are taking care of these very ancient skulls and mummies. I actually got to unwrap a mummy. It was just incredible. And it all came down to the fact that I have the tools and I have the certification and knowledge behind forensics. So it really opened a lot up for me, not just UFOs. I mean, it, and, and again, gold standard. I probably could investigate anything. And, and that's not a cocky statement. Most people can't. If you're following the justice, Department of Justice rules on, you know, investigations and protocols and methodologies, um, anyone, you know, anybody can do that. I was able to speak with Mr. L.A. Marzulli on this matter, and he brought some interesting theories on the cases of elongated skulls. So from your research and speaking at the Ozark Mountain UFO Conference in 2018, are elongated skulls that you found in Peru and Bolivia really worth looking into? And also you stated that you did some DNA testing. What did you find? The DNA test came back and it was very interesting because, you know, we, we didn't find alien, dang it. We didn't find hybrid, dang it, sort of. But we did find that the Paracas people um, were there a lot earlier and there's a timeline. And L.A., it's kind of his thing, so I let him get into the details of that. But, yeah, they're absolutely worth looking into. Uh, the Paracas skulls are probably um, more fascinating than um, Bolivia. Bolivia was fun and, you know, it has a different uh, flavor to it and um, had some harrowing times in Bolivia, by the way. <laughs> so, but I love LA. I've been with him um, 
not all, not every investigation in Peru I've done with LA, but I have done a lot with him. I love the guy. He he's just on it. He's he's just, you know, he he's such a great guy. Can you go into detail on those investigations that you did with Mr. L.A. Marzuli in Peru? Yeah, we it's the same thing. We just set up a nice clean area. Um, you know, we get the skulls and, you know, we're taking the DNA. Sometimes um, they let us have a tooth, which is awesome because, um, you know, the inside of the tooth isn't contaminated in any way, shape or form. So we always want that. We also go deep into the skull and, you know, take out, um, you know, a lot of the residue and resin that you can scrape off. And the DNA is um, pretty remarkable. What we haven't had a chance to get yet is we get the mitochondrial, but the other ones are getting a little difficult. <laughs> it's like, uh. Difficult in what way? We're, we're not, ap we, we can't capture the entire DNA sequence. So, you know, we get the mitochondrial, which is the mother's side, but the dad's side has eluded us so far. And you still, we learned a lot from mito mitochondrial and getting, you know, that mother's side, uh, mother's side offers a lot of information. So, you know, but the paternals, uh, a little harder to get, so... So how has being a former Department of Defense employee and former private investigator helped with your investigations into the UFO phenomenon and the study of ancient artifacts? Uh, basically, you know, the PI, I actually never worked as a private investigator, but I took it for the training. You know, it's just more training um, that is available uh, to civilians. So that was why I actually went in and I learned so many little things and so many great um, methods and, and little tricks of the trade, so to speak. So I use a lot of that in um, investigations. And as far as um, employee at the DOD, it was, um, you know, I wrote programs. So this is the same thing as, you know, as when I had a star team, when I wrote all the protocols and rules and deployment methods. And I also um, was a director of SAT, which is the special assignment team. And we were very controversial within MUFON because SAT team doesn't talk about SAT team. <laughs> like people were furious that, you know, we worked kind of in the background. But the, the reason we did that and the reason I designed this program was because you have people that come forward that don't want to put their reports on a database that anybody can go to. Um, they're very confidential. A lot of times they're extremely sensitive in what they're reporting. And um, so I think that's where the DOD job helped the best is like, I understand processing programs. For those that want to begin their own investigations, what are some basic steps that they need to follow? I think the good one, the probably the best thing is um, good, interviewing skills. So as you're interviewing uh, witnesses, you know, you really want to speak like 10% of the time and they're speaking 90. So that's, um, yeah, some good interviewing skills, maybe pick up a few tools of the trade, so to speak, a tri-field meter would be the first thing I would buy. In fact, I think I did. <laughs> I think it was the first thing, you know, and, um, and a body cam, honestly, because you can miss things and I've caught things that I didn't see, but my body cam did. So those would be the first two things I would. Um, MUFON's also a really good place to start because it's great for beginners because it's beginner level. You know, it, it's, and, you know it, it's beginner level. So until you get to star team and I, I think they, um, I think sat left when I left. So I think you, you do learn a lot. You, you can get a decent um, start. But um, I, I'm all about uh, individual and independent work. And there's a, there's a big reason for that, honestly. For my younger viewers and listeners and those new to this topic, can you share with us what is MUFON and, and what part do you play with the organization? I'm no longer with the organization. Um, I actually worked my way up to number two. And I was director of investigations. And it's just... You know, there, there's, there's issues. There's issues. There's, you know, MUFON is known to be controversial. It's got a lot of bad history. It's just, you know, I just, um, you get up there and it was, you know, when I could no longer contribute anything, then I left. And I like the independence. But 
for the other new people, it's Mutual UFO Network, which is MUFON. And what they do is um, they have field investigators. So you're in a state and you pass your FI, field investigator exam. And then the, the state director starts giving you cases and you just start working them with the knowledge you just had. So the problem is, is that, like I said, I don't know anybody else with the forensics that nobody else is doing that, that I know of. I mean, I would love to find out someone is doing that. Um, yeah. And, and there's not a lot of tools. Like a lot of these investigators, they don't have anything but a pen and a pencil and a piece of paper and a notebook. And, and that's okay because documenting these cases, but I think that, you know, for being the oldest, <laughs> you know, UFO group, um, you, you'd think they would have like fixed this matter by then you know well i hear there is a mufon university do they teach you the procedures on how to investigate from your knowledge i think um mufon university it, you know um i didn't pay too much attention to that but um i they do but i think you still have to pass that fi test and that is you know you buy the big book you know the great big binder and you know and, and that way you keep it so you always have a great reference but um, then you can move on to the university and, you know, I, I didn't go to the university, I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. You have so much amazing background knowledge to where you're able just to easily go through an investigation, which is amazing. And I'm aware that back in 2016, you were a lobbyist for the disclosure of the UFO mystery. For those that may not be familiar with with that and your efforts. Can you tell us exactly what you did in Washington, D.C. to push for UFO transparency as a lobbyist? Sure. And a lot of it is, you know, just contact, contact senators, contact congressmen. And, you know, the best thing was when ATIP came out, right? And it opened everything up. So, you know, it was like Rand Paul. So I called Rand Paul and I'm like, this new program, like, where did that money come from? Because, you know, Rand Paul's all about, you know, financial and fiscal securities. And, you know, so you kind of have to know who you're talking to and then hit hit them with, yeah, I might want to know where that money came from, too, because um, it didn't come from the Pentagon budget. So that was one thing. But it was really just contacting emails, you know, mailing things, knocking on doors, which you can and can't do sometimes. So it depends on if Congress is in session. Um, but that was it. And, and what I really wanted was answers. So I kept with the military stuff and the things that had high value evidence, such as TikTok, um, TikTok, I'm sorry, <laughs> TikTok, TikTok and, you know, all, Gimbal, all the other great videos. But um, it was really just trying to get them to know that there's people out here that want answers and they've got them and we want them. And so that's basically what I did. What I found out is that lobbyist is a really not a good um, term in DC. So, and I also noticed I never once had to show my ID. So I didn't re, re, um, do my credentials because you don't need them. Honestly, if you, if you're the, if you are, don't mind picking up a phone and talking to your representatives and, and even waiting a couple of days and you just keep calling because you're busy or they're out or, you know, they you schedule a call with them. It takes a bit and you have to have a thick skin in D.C. I got to tell you that much, but you, you don't need it. You don't need a lobbyist ID to uh, get the ear of our lawmakers. You know, they work for us, right? That is very interesting. Thank you so much for putting that um, into perspective. While we're on the topic of DC and the Pentagon, what were your thoughts on the recent UAP hearing? I know a lot of people were a little disappointed. I was not. I mean, I, we have active lawmakers sitting on a panel. Of course, did they ask the right questions? No, I'm screaming like, no, 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 this is, you know, these are better questions. Um, and I really, didn't think the guys in charge of the new program um, were very vetted. And I, I that was a little disappointing to me because how do you, like as a, as a military officer just taking charge of a new command, how do you not get debriefed from the prior 
guy who ran the program. I mean, that just made no sense to me. He, They had no information or they're not talking about it, you know, about a lot of the stuff that we already know. Lou Elizondo, Chris Mellon, uh, Tom DeLong, they put this out already. It's, it's out here and they didn't seem to be aware of that at all, but it's a great first start. And I do believe that Mellon and uh, Lou, um, which I, I do believe they're going to go in and answer, start at, at, oh, I'm sorry, answering questions, but also to brief. And I think most people think that they've all been briefed and that, that's not true, but most of them have. So this is it's still in steps. And it's like Lou says, this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. So for me, this is a nice first shot. I have to agree with you on that. Chase, we are coming towards a break. We'll be right back after this. gigawatt paranormal powerhouse KUNX DB BX This is Micah Hanks of the Micah Hanks program right here on KUNX and right now you're having your paradigm shifted by the one and only Christina Gomez source for alternative talk radio on the internet the x howdy folks this is lou elizondo and you are listening to my very good friend christina gomez on shifting the paradigm do you have an interest in the paranormal then you'll love the unxnetwork.com the x is your streaming audio and video for everything supernatural strange and mysterious like ufos bigfoot ghosts and so much more from hosts like Jimmy Church, Whitley Strieber, Micah Hanks, and Christina Gomez. Visit the unxnetwork.com show page for a complete list of all the paranormal programs you'll find on the X. Be sure to follow us on Twitter for updates at KUNXDB. Follow our Facebook group, Unx Network. Find the podcast on Spotify, iHeart, Audible, and Apple Podcast. It's time. It's new. It's the X. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Explaining the unexplained, the new unxnetwork.com. Hi, hi, this is Race Hobbs, head of programming at the new Unex Network, and you're locked on Shifting the, the paradigm, paradigm with the intrepid Christina, Christina Gomez, Gomez on, on the X. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. I'm gonna 
Welcome back. With me today is my guest, Chase Klutsky. So what do you think will happen next after this recent UAP hearing? I think that they're going to want more answers. They're going to want more um, transparency on what the program is doing, what they're finding. I, I think they're going to want more briefings. Uh, you know, who should be sitting in front of them is Robert Salas. Uh, you know, these there's some things that need to come forward. And I believe, um, you know, Captain or Mr. Salas is in going and briefing Brazil. So, you know, this is something that, you know, we just need to catch up and, you know, put the right people in front of our lawmakers. And of course, UFO Twitter is a force multiplier. So they're all over this, um, you know, pushing things forward. Like we want, we want Lou Elizondo, we want Mellon, you know, we want Robert Salas sitting in front of you guys. And that's also the phone calls that we can make. And I often put on my uh, Twitter feed, um, cause everyone knows I love UFO Twitter. Um, I stay on the positive side. <laughs> I, I don't engage in, you know, anything else, but my UFO Twitter and, you know, I'm always putting up like the number for the Senate, the number for Congress. And, you know, don't be afraid to call. Like, honestly, they work for us and I want answers and I'm a citizen. I'm, I'm in your district. Um, you want my vote? You're going to talk to me. And I think that's something that the more they hear, you know, like what's up with this UFO stuff? A little bit earlier, you brought up Robert Salas. For those that may not be familiar with him, can you explain who he is and why he is significant when it comes to this conversation? He actually broke open the story of nuclear missiles being taken offline. And this is the Maelstrom. And forgive me, I can't remember the year, but, you know, as you're watching this thing, you know, the each missile shoot like absolutely go offline and shut down, which is impossible, by the way. He's getting reports from his team and security team up top saying there's this huge red glowing light or orb and it's they're terrified. And you know, this is something that, you know, the the text came in and you know they checked everything, everything was perfectly fine. But you know, this is a legit um event and and the significance is that, you know, it's a nuclear thing. So it's a nuclear capability that they have. So he's just got um, a lot. I believe that Mr. Salas could easily say a couple more things um, than he could he, that he could do in public because they're probably still classified. So, but in a, in a group sitting in front of the lawmakers, as long as they have the security clearance needed for that knowledge, because not all all of them do right so i think i think that he can offer significant information like it, it just they have to know that this actually happened so this isn't something that's probable or something we should think like can they oh they can and we know it and it was fully investigated so to me it, that's that's such a significant event because it's modern day and he's still here and telling the story, unlike people from Roswell or, you know, some of these other, you know, great cases that are pretty, pretty popular. So, but for him, for him, I mean, I think he's a hero, honestly, you know, this is, he's no joke. I actually love the guy. <laughs> he, he and my husband talk a little bit because my, you know, my husband's uh, was commander of a nuclear submarine. So <laughs> they have fun sometimes. Oh he's my a goodness. sweetheart. Do you think Mr. Robert Salas would be invited to a UAP hearing in the future? I do. And I and the reason I say this is because, of, once again, the push from us in the UFO community that, yeah, we understand you got the new guys, you know, kind of like running this new UFO program or UAP program. They obviously didn't have a lot of valuable information. Let, let's tell you who is. And so my list is honestly is um, Lou Elizondo, which I adore, whom I adore, I should say, you know, uh, Chris Mellon and absolutely without a doubt, Robert Salas. And those are the people you don't want to give them a big long list, but these are the people with the most crucial information that they need to hear. I don't, how, how do you not invite the guy <laughs> that ran the program that actually had a TV show, talking about things, putting out videos, and and 
you know, I do know he's been in talking, but the open hearing is what. So Lou has been and Chris has been so essential of keeping this going in D.C. as well. And they he don't they don't get enough credit for that. And they deserve all of it, all of it, every single bit of it. I didn't I don't know anyone else, um, you know, going in and being invited in um, in the UFO field. So I, I just you know, they they there's such a credit to this community. Um, they bring a lot of respect and a lot of um, just amazing persona, honestly. Do you know what Elizondo and Chris have spoken about during their visits in DC? No, well, it, just what they, they say publicly, but you know, that's, that's something that when people understand hearings, a lot of times, they were behind clo closed doors for a reason because they're protecting ways and means. Um, you know, like what kind of technology do we have? So Lou and the guys could go in and they could talk about we have this, you know, system on you know this boat that literally um, caught this, but they they can't put it out to the public because then our enemies know what kind of capability we have. So this is something where. Um, I'd like to see them in a public hearing, but I know for a fact that that's probably the stuff that they would be doing behind the closed doors. And um, obviously they would start at the top. So, you know, but Lou is not going to talk about that. And um, he's classy not to. He may, I know he's under an NDA and I know people get tired of hearing him say that, but if, if you don't know how, DC works. He's absolutely putting out every word he possibly can. He knows things he can't say. And, you know, these are things that if we could get him behind the closed doors and keep these lawmakers interested and see what we have already, um, I think that's that would be our next big push. I mean, to me, that's essential. So, but I don't, I don't think Lou... He's going to say everything he can, but what he can't say, he's not going to say. And good for him because he's honorable. He's honorable. And while on this topic, what are your thoughts on the government classifying UFOs as a potential threat? Do you think it makes sense or is it nonsensical? Again, you know, I have a, a, <laughs> a military wife for over 30 years. So my husband's retired now, but um, I we think differently. Like I think military people, um, even the civilians who work inside the system, we think they, yes, I absolutely. If we don't know what they are, we don't know their capabilities and they're in our space, absolutely is a threat, a potential threat. So I know there's a lot of um, UFO witnesses and people out there that they hate it when people say that, but I'm sorry. I mean, this is how, again, DC works. They would never touch this topic if it wasn't a national security issue. So once again, that threat narrative is actually what blew this wide open in DC. So this is, um, and yeah, it, it literally, technically by the book is would be classified a national security threat, period. I mean, it's the definition, it, it fits everything. And I just, um, yeah, I believe so too, until I know exactly what's going on. You had a pretty interesting experience back in 2010. And while working for MUFON, you spoke and visited with a witness in Tennessee that stated that he just saw some lights in the sky. So you went there to find out more and you had a pretty extreme experience. I mean, you saw something that you could never forget. Take us back to that day. What happened? Yeah, so the witness um, literally was calling because, you know, these orange orbs, um, he was reporting that he was seeing them and that actually he and his cousin would be chasing them down these, you know, country roads because because where he lives, I mean, it's rural. I mean, it's like, I didn't even know people lived that far out. Like, <laughs> how, where do you get groceries? <laughs> so, but um, I got there, it, it, it got stalled for a little bit. So I call the witness, I do the interview and I definitely need to get out there. But unfortunately, that was the same time as the Tennessee flood, that everything was flooded from Memphis to Nashville. I mean, it was a nightmare. So I had to wait for the waters to recede. And when that happened, um, 
it was almost good to go. Like almost all the roads are open. And he called one night and he's like, Chase, there's so much going on right now. He goes, this is exactly what happens when those triangles show up. And I'm like, triangles? You didn't say anything about triangles before. I'm like, what? So um, I grabbed my go bag and I picked up um, another investigator and we went. The minute we pulled into his driveway, he's like all excited that we're there. And, um, you know, I remember him saying something about being relieved that we didn't show up with the big, you know, uh, Ghostbuster lights, and all the crazy UFO stuff. But um, he immediately like, come here, come here, come here. Like, look, look up here. And so I'm looking up and it takes a minute, you know, because I just got a vehicle. So, you know, for my eyes to adjust and then I see what he's talking about. And it was just so weird because there's like these little lights in the sky and, you know, they would kind of like flicker and then they come back and they stay on and then they work in unison and then they just all go do their little things and they're zigzagging and all sorts of things. And I'm already like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Right. So I'm just like trying to rule out usual suspects. I got my iPad out and I'm just like, you know, satellites, you know, which I know they're not. I mean, this is not how they move. So, but I still have to, I, I have to do my due diligence. Once again, gold standard, you know, take shortcuts. So you have to rule out the certain things. And so actually, if, if you got bored looking at this little group, all of a sudden you could look and there's another little group and there's another little group. And I was just blown away by that. And then it was um, about that time the witness suggested, he's like, look, Chase, I have this big cornfield out there. And he goes, we have a panoramic view. So this is May and you know the corn's only about this high. So it's pliable. So we're not gonna hurt anything going out in the cornfield. So we get there and it's huge. And he was absolutely right. And there is no light pollution whatsoever. And it was just an amazing, I, I was thrilled. I'm just like, oh my gosh. So now I'm trying to, you know, kind of see if I can get these other lights again and try to get pictures and video, which of course we got some, but they're just like little things, little lights. <laughs> so, and not very impressive. So it wasn't long after that, that the witness literally says, oh my God, oh my God, here it comes. I knew it, I knew it type of, you know, he's going on and, you know, and, and he's like, his excitement wasn't about what was going to happen. The excitement was he's not going to be the only one seeing this. So he feels like he has reputable, you know, witnesses with him. So sure enough, I look up and yeah, here comes a white light. And it's just kind of coming like towards us in the field. And then two more lights show up and I'm like, oh my God, there's three of them. I'm picking up equipment. I'm telling you, <laughs> you should see my stash of equipment. I mean, I have, you know, cameras, different makes and models. I have my tri-field meter, like all the stuff that's going on. And I'm picking it up because it's a frigging triangle. And I know it's a triangle because it's blocking out the stars. And as it's coming towards us, it's just, it's ominous. I mean, it's just, you're in awe. I mean, I, I, you're just standing there and I'm trying to get, you know, pictures and my cameras weren't working. Everything was dead. Everything was dead. And we hear about battery drain and paranormal investigations and UFO investigations. It's, it's a rare thing or it's not a rare thing. I mean, it's something that happens. It's rare when it doesn't. I was so mad. I, I think I cussed and said, I'm going to throw this effing camera across the field. <laughs> I was just so mad because it's right there. All my UFO investigations, it's right friggin' there. So I just, you know, we just watched it go over our heads, continue off. Once it disappeared, um, I just turned around and, you know, I, I was going to change out batteries. So um, I had a tri field meter and you have to screw the cover off to get it. And then I realized everything's back online. It wasn't battery drain. Everything was just shut down. Now it's all back up. Well, I'm going to change the batteries anyway, because, you know, <laughs> I'm a little OCD about, you know, certain things. And, you know, I just didn't want that to happen again. So as I'm doing that, all of a sudden, I just, I just got this feeling and it was just, <clears throat> I said, does anyone else feel like you're being watched? And I don't mean from up there. And it was about that time that I, I, I'm just hit. Like it was physical and every single cell on my body is in terror, not fight or flight, absolute terror. 
And I just remember turning and starting to run. And as I turned, I noticed the witness turned at the exact same time. And we're just running. Nobody said, what was that? Nobody said uh, run or, you know, anything scary. It was literally physical. It was physical attack. And I'm just running, running, running. And it was so weird because it was almost hypnotic because the witness, you know, all I'm watching is this light in front of me do this, bing, 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 bing. And then I realize it's the witness who has a flashlight and he's running. And then all of a sudden he stops and I hit this wall. I hit the witness, but I hit him so hard. I don't know how he's still standing up. And he said, what the F is that? And in his left hand, he had one of those big hunters, like halogen flashlights. And he threw his arm straight out and standing there was this little being, this little gray being. And it was so stoic that had I not seen his eyes and the skin, I would have thought it was a robot. I mean, you know, how do you go from black darkness to, you know, this big light in your face because this being wasn't six feet from us. It was about six feet. And so we were close, especially with the handout. And I just, just remember starting to run again. And we get in the car, we're bailing out of there. We even took air getting out of that cornfield. I mean, he was hauling and we get back up in his driveway and I don't know when the fear left. I, I can't pinpoint that, but by the time we were in his, it, it hit in the driveway, I felt okay. And I, I just, I was so confused a little bit and I'm just, we get out and I'm like, what, what just happened? Like, why, why did we run? I mean, what's going on? I need to get back out there because I saw a being. I'm thinking footprints. I'm thinking, you know, trace DNA. I'm thinking all sorts of things. And it was just a remarkable moment. It was just horrific. I can tell you that I never want to feel that terror again. I would never want any person in this earth to feel that terror. It was, it was brutal. It was brutal. So anyway, by the time we get back there, sure enough, um, I can see because you know, the waters had just receded. So there was, you know, nice mud. I could see every step we took come and going, even running, um, nothing where he was, absolutely nothing. And of course, there's a part of me that's like, of course, of course, because that's how it goes. But there was another part of me and on the way home, I kept thinking to myself, BS, this is crap. Nobody gets everything in one night. What happened in that cornfield? What I can tell you is that we didn't run. Whatever was going on, we weren't supposed to be there. And they made sure we weren't. So I still don't know what to think so much about it. Um, I get a knot in my stomach every time I talk about it um, or even thinking about it. Uh, about After a couple of years, like I'll even be driving at night by myself. And, you know, I just get like barely get that feeling again. You know, I've never had it since, but you know, just barely just the memory. And I've, I've had to pull over and just shake it off. And, you know, like, <laughs> you know, go to your happy place, think of puppies, <laughs> you know? And it's, um, it, it was just an incident that it actually changed me for a lot. But there was also a side that didn't hit me until later. When I started um, working with um, abductees and experiences more, and they say that, a lot of times they can project their emotions on you. And then I felt so bad for that little being because it's like, if that's the fear he was feeling that he put on us, I I, I would have picked him up and helped him, <laughs> help him hide. Like, what, what can I do? Like, you know, but um, it was just, it was just a crazy night. It was a crazy night. It definitely sounds that way. And the fact that you still have residual fear 12 years later when you think about it is kind of insane. So let's say you could, you could go back in time and you didn't have that intense fear from that encounter of, of what the possibly of what that entity was feeling. What would you have done or what would you have wanted to do in relations to an investigation? I honestly, I want some DNA, but I wouldn't, you know, approach it, approach it like that. I mean, I would definitely, first thing I would do is get on a knee. So I was his size and um, I'm not very tall anyway, but hopefully he would know I was not a threat. I say he, cause I'm a mother of boy, grandmother of boys. I don't know what sex it was. I didn't see anything, anything that would re reveal that. But 
and and I would just tell him, uh, like, I'm, I'm not going to approach you unless unless it's okay to, um, and but I sure would like to talk to you. And um, is there any way that I can just rub this Q-tip on your hand and maybe in your mouth? <laughs> Let me get about six of these, maybe ten, <laughs> like little samples, because um, I never just take one of anything ever. I take three, <laughs> so I um uh, that would be where my head would have been at that moment. But it would have been first about him. Yeah. And then, of course, I'd ask, like, like, why are you here? Like, is there something I can help you do? Um, like, what are you doing in this cornfield? So my next question would be, how do you think you would communicate with this being? Because, I mean, it seems like you have a lot of questions, and I would as well if I was in that situation. How would you be able to communicate with that being? I would try verbal at first and, um, and, but everything I'm thinking would be the same questions. I mean, you know, that telepathic, um, communication seems to be, um, quite frequent. And, and we hear this a lot from our experiences, experiencers that it comes, it comes from it's telepathic. So I would definitely keep that in mind as well. So right before you had this encounter, the witness wrote to MUFON that he just saw lights in the sky. So why did you end up going to that location? I mean, for for many light stories, they can be kind of bland and, and sometimes believed not significant enough to investigate. So why did you go? Basically, you know, he said his brother, he and, or he and his cousins were chasing them down dirt roads. That means this orb or these orbs are moving and maneuvering on a road. And so that was intriguing. Um, but I also don't investigate from a phone. And a lot of times I get out there and I, not every investigation or every report I took, I went out there because I can't do anything about, you know, a, a pin light you saw, you know, dart across the sky two years ago, if that makes sense. So there are some I don't go, but this one, it's, it's it was really what made me want to talk to him is I also wanted to see like this area. I mean, I, it's just, it's just so credible that um, he and his cousins were chasing lights down the road. Yeah. I want to see that road, <laughs> but it was really me jumping and not making another appointment to go out. And then I left that same night. I mean, it was, it wasn't like early morning or anything. I'm telling, I'm left at like 7 PM. <laughs> I was on it. <laughs> Do you happen to remember what else that report said that he wrote to MUFON? Um, wow, I haven't read that in a while. Um, I, it, it was pretty simple. It was pretty simple just about, you know, these orbs and they were orange and, you know, um, maybe that was about it. And he also, when I got there, um, confided that his kids were afraid to go upstairs and sleep. And, and they both talked about the orange light. So, uh, but that was not in the report. That was in my report. Um, yeah, he was very simple. And these kids that were scared to go upstairs, were they scared of the orb because of the unknown? Or do you believe it was a sensation that was being transmitted? I, I don't know, because I didn't get to talk to the kids and I wanted to, and uh, Mama Bear came out and said, no. Um, we're going to, I'm going to handle this one. So uh, she didn't want me talking to them because um, I, I have the feeling they were telling them that they were just pretty lights and it, like a firefly or it's just something cool or, you know, but um, they did not want me talking to them. And I was okay with that because um, I would absolutely hate to say something that scared them further or made them think of it further. So um, they just let me know what they were hearing from the kids. So I didn't get to ask. No, and that and that makes perfect sense, and I respect that as well. When you're dealing with children, it's it's a different dynamic altogether. And you're right; you have to be very careful with what you say and with what you ask, because it's going to stick with them for the rest of their life. And I'm not sure how old they are, but anywhere from teen and below, you got to be really careful. And so the fact that Mama Bear came in, as you mentioned, to protect her young is is completely understandable. Totally is. Chase, we are coming towards oh, another break. It. We'll be right yeah. back.
million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse. KUNX DB. BX. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. I want to thank all of you for listening to The X, but did you know you can watch live streaming video and catch your favorite video casts on the UnX Network YouTube channel? Wow, you mean I can watch The X shows anytime? That's right. Watch any show anytime, even binge watch your favorite programs. Which shows are on the UnX Network YouTube channel? You can watch Most Haunted with Dan Terry, Entity Voices, Paranormal Evidence, Paranormally Blonde, and Unexplained Phenomena Australia, and many more. Also, be sure and catch live coverage of special events and special broadcasts from the UnX Network. That's great. I'm going to subscribe to the UnX Network channel right now. Awesome. You can find everything you need to know about the YouTube channel at unxnetwork.com. That's unxnetwork.com. It's your one-stop shop for everything unexplained. It's the new mainstream. It's the UnX Network. Explaining the unexplained. The new unxnetwork.com. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. Gold loves chaos, uncertainty, and disarray. History shows us what gold does when people aren't sure, aren't sure about the government, the stock market, their jobs, or their retirement savings. Our national debt is skyrocketing. Gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against inflation and a stock market that might take years to recover. So what can you do right now to protect yourself? Call United Gold Group. We offer gold and other precious metals delivered securely within 72 hours. Are you worried about the stock market? We can also help you set up a real gold or silver IRA or a 401k. Safe and secure. United Gold Group makes gold ownership affordable. Call now and get up to $2,500 in free gold or silver with a qualified IRA. Call 800 750 853-8534. That's 800 753 Or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. with Richard Dolan called Admissible, published in 2014, talking about the investigation procedure when looking for UFOs, ghosts, Bigfoot, and other strange phenomena. Did you learn anything while writing the book? 
or was the entire book written from experience with boots on the ground investigations? It was just experience and it's a field manual. So it's, it's not like a policy or a school. It's just really things that I learned along the way because I've made some mistakes and, or things that I know are just stupid, right? Like you really shouldn't put UFO stuff all over your car and big move on stickers. And, you know, cause maybe the witness doesn't want his neighbors to know he called you. Right. So there's a, a lot of consideration that comes with experience. And also like another example would be, um, I'm walking, I, I go to them in Kentucky and I'm walking with this guy who's going to show me where an alleged landing was, right? So I've got my girlfriend with me, Renata, and she's about my size. I'm 5'1", you know, 110 pounds at that time, right? So, and we're walking and walking and walking, and all of a sudden, I'm done. we're just keep walking. And then it hit me, you know, he's going to hurt us. And how stupid am I? Because I have a second person with me, but if he did anything, she just pee her pants, right? That's, she would just pee her pants and I'm a fighter. So, you know, I probably do what I can, but at this point I'm thinking it, I'm already too late. Like this, that was so stupid to just walk in the woods with this guy, you know, because I'm so focused on wanting to see what he's talking about. So I always suggest that, you know, I actually lied. I pulled my phone out and I said, hold it, hold it. I said, I have to, you know, my husband's following me on, you know, my, my stalker app and I have to let him know. Cause if I don't check in at every 15 minutes, I said, trust me, there will be drones over this area in 15 minutes, right? Totally lie. I had none of that. But I, I just really wanted to put some out. I really got the creeps. Like, and, and I have a good sense, I think. And he put a knot in my stomach. I mean, after a little bit, I'm just walking. I'm just like, you know, if it's any further than this. And he's like, no, it's right here. And, and of course, I didn't see anything. But I did not get a good feeling. And um, so I, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> My husband goes on the kind where if I could go somewhere, like in woods, my husband comes with me. So this kind of book would be recommended for those that want to research on how to do proper investigations, but also to remain safe. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it's it's a lot of, uh, we have, a, and and for it to be admissible, because what, what good is it to go out to a witness house? house, do all this, and then you don't even give them a decent report. No, 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 no. Right. So it's, it's really important. I also put all the forms in there, all the forms I use um, for my investigations right down to an after action, like what I could have done better, um, what equipment, you know, would have been something I could use that I didn't have already. But, but, um, but it, it also, I, the do's and don'ts and, you know, like another don't would be, you know, um, and I, they have a witness is like, I saw this disc shape and, but it was huge. And the investigator goes, oh my God, it was a, it was a mothership. No, <laughs> like really kind of wanted to punch him off the couch. If you want to know what I mean, I'm just like, you don't use words like that. You have to be professional, you know? So it's just like a police officer doesn't really investigate in a home, I don't either. So now it's like, meet a library, meet a McDonald's, I don't care where, but I'm gonna take them out of their comfort zone, right? Dogs barking, phones ringing, you know, kids need a snack. I'm gonna bring them to a separate area. So those are some of the things I've learned in, and um, I actually am very proud of that book. You always need to remain vigilant when you are dealing with strangers. While you do want to be friendly with them, especially wanting to understand the encounter that they that they had, you always need to remember that you don't know these people. You don't know their intentions. And so you always need to be and remain safe at all times. And especially for us females as well. We've got to be a little bit extra, <laughs> extra safe. And just add one more thing, um, and that was... I don't become friends with my witnesses. And I see so many, like they, they call them, oh, you're part of the family. Because for the first time, most of these witnesses, somebody's believing them. Like somebody's coming out and working. They're so grateful. And, uh, you know, I've been in investigations where, you know, 
I'm starving. They're barbecuing. They're like, come get something to eat, Chase. I'm like, no, 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 I'm good, guys. I got my own. I'm good. Thank you. And I always keep a distance. And I'll tell you why. Because so the witnesses get so much attention while the investigation is going on. And then all of a sudden it stops. And I'm on to another one. They feel abandoned. They feel like I let them down, like why, you know, like, and it's, it's hard. I don't want to, I don't want to give them that secondary feeling. So although I'm friendly, like you said, friendly, um, I don't engage with the family except in, in investigation terms. And I, again, it's the same thing a police detective would do. He, you know, he's not going to come over and, you know, look at, you know, something that happened, a like robbery or whatever, and say, hey, I want one of those hot dogs. You know, it's just, you have, it, it's all about professionalism to me because these witnesses deserve that. And if they're trusting you and they call you and they, there's some pretty deep investigations that I've done and, you know, I just want to give that to them. I want to give them all the professionalism as possible. That is very crucial. How do you manage dealing with abduction cases when you are working with MUFON? And even when I'm not working with MUFON, and I'll be honest with you, um, I pass them on. I take the initial report and because they contact me, but I tell them, this is not my specialty. I'm more of a science person. And I, once again, I believe the abductees and contactees, it's a special population. And they deserve better skills than I have for them. So this will be something that I don't drop them. I mean, I literally will give them to Kathleen Martin, Yvonne Smith, you know, and some of the people. And if they're too busy, they have their uh, circle and they have their tribe that can help this person. Um, I don't work abduction cases. I, I will go if, if they think they have physical or trace evidence or if I'm needed. But as far as working abductions, that's not my skill set. And I want them to have the best. So, and that's Kathleen and Yvonne. And, um, and they're always thankful when I do that. At first, they're kind of like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, but they're always thankful saying, oh my gosh, thank you so much for sending me. Kathleen's amazing. And, you know, the same thing. But yeah, not my pop, not my thing. And I think it's good that you know your strengths and your weaknesses. I mean, it's very difficult to be, to, to know absolutely everything. But as long as you have a few strengths and you're good at it, that's what matters. And that is what is valuable more than anything. It's better to be good at one skill than be like half-hearted in like 10 or 15 skills. So I, I admire that about right. you. I also would be very afraid again, that in my, in, in my less experience with abductees that I say something that God forbid would hurt them or be absolutely the wrong thing. So I, I'm very cautious about, um, these witnesses, like they just need protection and, and they, they need the best we have. Absolutely. Chase, you have traveled the United States, jumping from state to state every few years due to your husband's job before he retired, but also going on trips to investigate witness cases. Aside from Tennessee, what are some memorable locations that you have visited while on investigations? Definitely Australia. Um, I was there. There, um, you know, with the whole school sighting, and I was on that property. Now, of course, it's many, many, you know, decades later, but um, it was memorable because it's just an iconic, an iconic um, event. So, the Westall School, um, that was one. And I loved um, being in Peru, and I, I just. There's something about that place. It's just, it's magical. So um, I've had plenty of things there as well. And um, I don't know. And, and of course, you know, I've been down into the coal mines of Kentucky because these leatherneck, you know, badass guys, so to speak, literally um, won't go down this certain chute down the cave because these are lizard man, you know. And so we know of reports of reptilians. So, you know, I'll go there. If you don't know what it is, I'll go, right? That's just what it is. But that was memorable because I just, these guys, like, they're just tough guys. And they're scared to go down the shaft because, and, and they're not prone to lies. I mean, these are hardcore, hardworking men that don't care about your little fan fantasies or little ghost scares or, you know, that. So it's really memorable. I, I really like that one. 
and uh and of course i got to pick some coal to take home for a souvenir but um there's honestly there's just so many there really are um uh, working with chris bledsoe like we had an, an event together um in north carolina and you know um everybody was the whole team was missing eight minutes all three helmet cams or body cams showed eight minutes were gone so and chris bledsoe was with me <laughs> you can't be around chris and not expect something to happen i promise you because i investigated him and a lot of stuff that happened at his place including um the burning tree that mit found no accelerants and um no signs of lightning strike because i guess they're specific um there's just all sorts of things but if you're with chris expect the unexpected <laughs> when you went in this coal mine and where these these men were terrified when you entered that little shaft um what were the procedures that you followed in order to remain safe oh yeah well first it's it just so happens because i worked a case in mina arkansas at a crystal mine and before you can go to these mines you have to take a course so i actually have a mine and i just hat by the way and a, a, a certification card and so that was one but i wasn't by myself i was not i had a couple guys with me and they clearly knew what they were doing and i, I was never felt like i was in harm's way whatsoever but i did i had my own hat and uh i still have my hat it's on display in my office <laughs> but it's just fun stuff like i just get i find myself in the, the craziest places like i'm in you know, Louisiana, you know, waist deep in the swamp looking for the Honey Island Swamp Monster. I mean, yeah, I just, I just love what I do. And it definitely shows in your work and in your smile and also on your website, uh, which is under your name. You wrote an article on the different types of bias. And this is something that really isn't spoken about in depth. So Chase, tell me, what are the different types of bias? There's I mean, there's a religious bias, like, you know, they can't accept anything unless, you know, it fits their, their storyline. Biases on, you know, it just everything has to be explained. You know, you have, um, you know, people out there, especially on, like UFO Twitter, that they're just so biased. They're just, they're just not going to open up their mind and, and let a lot of this stuff sink in. And, you know, it, when I first started being nuts and bolts, it took me a long time to kind of not roll my eyes at the whole abduction thing. And then as you work it, investigation take take you take you where it's going. In other words, the evidence is going to take you to a, a conclusion. And and now I'm, I'm just I know it's real. I know it happens. So there's certain things that um, the biases you just and you can't bring them on investigation with you. You you have to whatever you think. It stays outside. When you get in, you are ears and little mouth. <laughs> You're all ears. And and it's really about, um, you know, keeping things very open and neutral. I don't walk into anything with a conclusion or even a mindset. I don't allow myself to say this is going to be real or this uh, witness is so credible um, that, you know, I know it's going to be real. Like I, everything just goes. You start at A and you end up at Z. And sometimes that can be rather difficult because bias and opinion is almost engraved in us. And so and so I feel like the article that you wrote kind of naming each bias, I believe, is very important. And people should really place that in consideration when they are doing investigations or even when they're doing interviews as well. That that is what I believe. And that's my opinion on that. So I just have a few more questions for you before we conclude today's interview. And science has been involved and interested in the communication with extraterrestrials, but I definitely wish it was talked about more. Since Nikola Tesla 100 years ago, he started looking into radio signals and connecting it to ET communicate, like uh, ET messages. And astronomers today monitor the skies looking for radio signals by intelligent life. From your research, what have you found when it comes to science and radio signals? Uh, I, one of the most fascinating and, and a modern phenomena is fast burst radio signals that are being picked up, not so much by SETI, but by colleges and these universities that are really set up with 
kind of more experimental type um, sky radio things. And it's it's something that was talked about for a while and then everything just shut down. You could get anything, um, rarely get anything from it. But there's some things that you can uh, YouTube on fast burst radio signals. And also I, I did a article on that with Carrie as well. And you'll find that on the field reports. Yes, I find it very fascinating. And like I said a little bit earlier, I wish it was talked about more. While I do love a good, you know, UFO sighting, UFO stories, things like this, I feel like science needs to be more involved. And in many cases, it kind of is just not really in the public eye or it doesn't catch people's interest altogether. But there there are a few people really bringing this to the limelight, such as yourself with your website and with your research. So I really, really appreciate that because I do believe that we need to get science more involved. We need to get more people's eyes on the scientific aspect while everything else is also important. When you when you bring in science, it just adds a little bit more credibility to all of these stories and investigations. Now, in a different article on your website, you bring up the famous <laughs> you bring up the famous booming sound that has been heard across the world over a span of years. What did you find in your research? And for those that are not familiar with these booming sounds, can you go into detail on the significance of this? Yeah, I, we get witnesses that, and, and sometimes it's not just one; it, it'll be a whole block or or a whole town, and there's just these horrific booms and big thundering uh, noises. And it's not thunder, it's totally different. Um, but they come from the sky and they'll hear like this really loud metal scraping. And, you know, like the, the airplanes like stopped, you know, mid sky and, and taking its wings off or something. It, it very, very odd, um, very odd noises. Um, there's also uh, reports of trumpets, like like trumpets are playing, but it's coming from the coming from the sky. So of course, um, I'm fascinated with these. Um, I love the uh, getting those kind of reports, but also researching that quite a bit. And so far, there's been no real answer. Like they'll say, well, you know, some guy down the road, you know, was playing a trumpet. It just sounded like that because the ozone was a certain. Now when the whole town's hearing something. So it's uh, I, it's one of my favorites. It really is one of my favorite mysteries. Um, and I hope people do go to um, a work site I do with uh, Carrie, um, great, great researcher called the fieldreports.com and reports is plural and it's just fieldreports.com and um, everything right down to the uh, Malibu underwater base investigation. So a lot of my fun stuff is on there. Talking about the Malibu underwater base, you released a report in 2017 about it. What were your findings? Findings was a thrush fault, and um, it, it really sits on intersecting um, earthquake lines, for lack of a better way to put that, right? So they have these, and as the little earthquake or the little things go, you know, these plates move up. So, um, and I know that when people go to the internet and look at it, it, it's impressive. It's why I investigated it. But I was out there on a, on a research vessel uh, for three days and we had the Tomahawk too, um, that we went down there and everything was side radar and videoed, all of that. And it's, it's, it's a rock. But I went further than that because I'm like, well, why does, why does that Google photo look so dang good? And so I called Google and talked to one of the guys that runs this program and he was awesome. And he's like, look, he said, these aren't photographs. They're not photographs. Most of what you're seeing in oceans and, you know, he said, they're not. He said, what happens is like our balloon, or our drone will go and then we'll snap some pictures and the computer fills in what it thinks it should, right? And I asked him too, I said, because what I got thinking out there in the water on the ship was, if we can see this, why are we not finding airplanes and, and ships? And you know what I mean? If, if we have all this photographic, you know, things that we can use from Google. But I also did the other thing and that was, they kept talking about um, uh, Magoo, like 
Point Magoo. It's just like it does military base, it's army and blah, blah, blah. They didn't research further because about 30 to 40 miles north of Point Magoo is a Navy base and it's the home of the underwater sea bees, the underwater construction crew. <laughs> so, you know, I'm like, if anybody was going to build a structure or maintain a structure, it's going to be them. They're right there. That's what they do. So I called to talk to the guy <laughs> sitting on the decks that night and asked him, I said, you know, what do you know about this? He says, we laugh all the time. Everybody asks us about that. He says, first of all, who would build <laughs> build a structure on top of a fault line, on top of intersecting fault lines? He says, first of all, that's just stupid. He said, but um, he's, he said, we've even gone out there. There's He says, there's nothing there. There's no opening. I, and I told him, I said, I know, I you know, we have the photos and side, side scan, but, um, you know, it was just fun. So that's, that's another um, example of, taking it another step further. Like, don't be afraid to call these guys. I have no problem calling, you know, people at Stanford University, and you know, for advice on DNA or, you know, anything. So I, I just kind of think instead of just looking at that, why did nobody, anybody saying, oh, look at this, it's real. It's Why didn't you call Google? Being confident is very important in this field. Chase, I have one final <laughs> question for you. In 2012, you wrote the children's book, Are Aliens Really Real? And it's pretty much a real conversation that you had with your then six-year-old grandson when he asked you that question. Do you think Gen Z or Zoomers are primed for this conversation? What are your thoughts on their interest in this subject? Honestly, I don't think they need a lot of um evidence. I, they kind of grew up with aliens on their video games and, you know, t movies. I didn't grow up with any of that. I think they're more open-minded to the concept of this as well, because, you know, here we are, little rock in, in a, a vast. So their science is much more advanced that, than it was when I was going to school in the 60s and 70s. So I think that the new generation coming up, which is why I adore you, you know I adore you so much, and UFO Jane and, you know, um, Danny Silva, you know, Chris Sharp, all these new guys, Vinny, you know, it's this new generation coming up. You guys are so smart, smarter than we were when we started, and I'm so happy to see this because we have been very excited to have new blood in this field. I always have a little joke that says, you know, you go to a MUFON meeting and it's like a bingo night at the old folks home. So to see you kids come in, oh my gosh. And I know you're not kid kids, but you are to me. And um, I'm just so proud of you guys. You're smart. I'm just so impressed with all of you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Chase, this has been such a lovely conversation. Being with you and, 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 I really loving this new generation coming up and I really want nothing but success and happiness. And I swear, if you need something and I have it, it's yours. I, I don't care if it's advice. I don't care if it's a piece of equipment, um, anything I can do to help any of you guys that are kind of new, but caught up. You weren't born yesterday. You were up all night. You guys are pretty clued in to the reality. So, you know, just thank you. Where can people find you online to stay up with your research? Uh, basically, it's just chaseklutsky.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Facebook. I don't do a lot of Facebook, but I'm very active on Twitter. Um, and if you follow me and I don't see that you followed me, kind of send me a private message because I like to follow you guys back. And so, yeah, find me on Twitter. I'll follow you back. Let me know. You're listening to the UnX Network, KUNX DV, Kansas City, Missouri. Chase is such an inspiration and so open with her knowledge and experiences. For those that want to do proper investigations when looking for UFOs, ghosts, cryptids, or other strange phenomena, take a look at her book, Admissible, that she wrote with Richard Dolan. And if you have kids or nieces and nephews, she wrote the child's book, are aliens really real? This makes a fantastic bedtime story or to just prompt your kids to start asking questions. 
our kids are our future and they always will be. They will be our future lawmakers, teachers, politicians, military officials, and lawyers. We have to give them the best and we can do that with knowledge along with loving kindness. I would like to mention that my new show, Strange Paradigms, will be airing every Friday at 3 p.m. PST, where I cover paranormal and mysterious news items of the week. This Friday show will actually be pre-recorded and on my own, but we still will be covering some fascinating articles from this last week. So make sure to ring the notification bell if you are watching this on YouTube. Also, take a look at my website at strangeparadigms.com to find show archives, guest appearances, social media links, and more. I want to wish you all a wonderful week. Please like this video or podcast on your platform of choice and share it with those who have the same interest. Subscribe if you haven't already because there's a lot more great shows coming to you soon. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the skies. Thank you.